Yes, thank you all. And, and thanks to Dr. Wolf. So we'll get started. And uh, those of you who just joined, Dr. Wolf is going on vacation at uh, 9.01 a.m. today. <laughs> and so we appreciate him taking time to speak to us today. So he is the Chief Emeritus of the Hand and Upper Extremity Service. He's an extremely well-known um, hand and wrist surgeon who uh, has published more than 200 papers and has uh, provided tremendous care for uh, lots of patients with hand and wrist problems, including athletes and musicians. And he's been working uh, on this um, total wrist, ar wrist arthroplasty for multiple years. And we're really looking forward to having the, um, the talk today to really inform us about this exciting procedure that he's now done um, almost 10 of. So we'll round up. But um, thank you very much for joining us, Dr. Wolf, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you, Dr. Bridges, and thank you, Kimberly, and distinguished uh, rheumatology faculty. For this opportunity to present some of the trials and tribulations of total wrist arthroplasty and our 30-year journey to develop a durable solution for patients with inflammatory and post-traumatic arthritis through kinematic design. In full disclosure, I'm the inventor and co-patent holder for the Kinematics Total Midcarpal Wrist Arthroplasty, which was approved by the uh, FDA in April and has now been implanted in seven patients. The most recent was yesterday. So we'll briefly review some implant history and the outcomes and how design may have contributed to its failures, some new techniques we've used to study total wrists, and close with some preliminary results of a novel design that I've been developing over the past three decades. The first recorded total wrist arthroplasty was performed in 1890 and was constructed of an ivory ball and socket with two fixation pegs in the metacarpals. The patient did well for many years until the device required removal for a draining tuberculosis fistula and he died a few years later. Many subsequent iterations of wrist arthroplasty can be roughly considered in four generations. The first was Swanson's hinged arthroplasty. Just over half of these lasted for more than two and a half years. Extremes of motion led to breakage, implant breakdown, cystic changes, and immune response to the implant's particles. The second generation featured a non-physiologic ball and socket design with, with a fixed center of rotation. The fixed center of rotation did not mimic the normal wrist's mobile center of rotation and allowed no carpal translation. Therefore, the implant stressed the bone component interface Further, a ball and socket articulation is entirely unconstrained in rotation, which will allow extremes of implant motion that further stress the distal component. Additionally, there was no offset between the fixed center of rotation and the middle metacarpal and radial stems. It's important to understand that the normal wrist features a palmar and ulnar inclination to the radial articular surface. So the trispherical total wrist arthroplasty was an HSS design that featured a 12 degree palmar tilt and an offset center of rotation as well as a sloppy hinge to decrease constraint of the ball and socket. A great concept, but ultimately long-term outcome studies continue to show a high incidence of distal component failure. It should be noted that no mechanical, kinematic, or clinical design testing preceded release and implantations of these designs. The next three decades featured many iterations of third generation implants that shared several design features. These collectively featured bony and growth convex on concave articulations, distal screw fixation of the carpal component, and a toroidal, conoid, or ellipsoid articulating shape designed to mimic the radiocarpal joint. Early publications of outcomes demonstrated complications that were almost exclusively about the carpal component, including loosening, dorsal perforation, instability, and dislocation. It should be noted as a group that these implants were designed predominantly to provide biaxial motion of flexion extension and radial ulnar deviation. Despite several different generation three designs, carpal component failure continued to be an issue with a 17% revision rate noted for an early iteration. However, dislocations virtually disappeared when DMARDs were subsequently introduced in 2000, yielding better control of inflammatory bone loss and synovitis. The fourth generation of total wrist arthroplasty includes new bearing surfaces and shapes, non-articulated designs, and more recently, wrist hemiarthroplasty. So I'd like to <clears throat> start by showing this case presentation of a patient some of you may know, um, who's a 67, who was at the time a 67-year-old right-hand dominant female with a long history of rheumatoid arthritis, who was referred to me in 2001 for ring and small tendon ruptures. 
She was well controlled on multiple medications and otherwise in excellent medical health. Her bilateral radiographs revealed severe erosions in palmar translation along with a caput ulna or dislocated and sharpened radial ulnar joint. She'd ruptured her ring and small extensor tendons and I recommended wrist fusion on the right side with tendon reconstruction and consideration of wrist arthroplasty on her non-dominant left side in the future. So we began with a complete wrist arthrodesis and tendon transfers to restore her ulnar digital extension. And here she is two months following surgery showing nice restoration of digital motion. 2003, we elected to perform a DARA excision of her distal ulna and a total wrist arthroplasty on her left side using one of the generation three designs on her non-dominant wrist. Here you can see her at four months post-op, showing a very respectable range of motion, good digital range of motion. And really, she was quite happy. Three years post-operatively, the radiographs demonstrated some early osteolysis, which was concerning, but overall excellent position and alignment. Here she is at three, three years with excellent motion and doing well. And you can see the difference between her fused wrist on the right side and her range of motion on the left side. 12 and a half years following the cemented total wrist arthroplasty, she returned and note the progressive osteolysis subsidence and component loosening. She wasn't painful. So here we have somebody in her late seventies, early eighties, who's got this, these loose components rattling around in her wrist, but she has no pain. So what do we do? Observe, remove and fuse, which is not a trivial operation or revise. Well, the die was cast when she came back two years later at age 85 with a painful and swollen wrist, now constant paresthesias in her thumb, index, and middle finger, no motion of her left index finger, and we were, our hand was forced. We had to do 